uh, we know that um, May is usually a very busy month. So thank you for joining this uh, uh, webinar series that will aim really to understand on how we uh, can be an active part of the solution not to phase out uh, toxic chemicals. And today we will focus more particularly on, on synthetic fiber textiles. Uh, for us, is it, uh, it is crucial uh, to engage um, uh, with many stakeholders, so first with policymakers, for you to be able to uh, design and enact better regulation, but also uh, consumers, and you are all uh, consumers, uh, for them to uh, make informed decision when uh, purchasing uh, plastic items, uh, but also for uh, pushing no, for uh, changes and, and different products offered by, by um, uh, producers. And it is also crucial to engage with businesses uh, in order to increase uh, transparency on the value change and uh, operate to reduce the use of toxic constituents in, in plastics and, and switch uh, to safer alternatives. So we strongly believe that uh, whether you are a consumer, manufacturer, entrepreneurs, policymakers, uh, you have a role to, to play. Um, now, I just wanted to give a few uh, words about our center. So we are the Regional Activist Center for Cyber Consumption and Production. We are based uh, in, uh, in Barcelona, and our main uh, mission is to support sustainable consumption and production patterns using a circular economy uh, approach. Um, and we uh, have a very strong focus on uh, pollution uh, prevention. Um, we believe that we need to have uh, more investments uh, there rather than having them to manage huge uh, remedi remediation costs, especially when talking about um, chemicals. And uh, right now we have, uh, well, we have strong priorities regarding uh, plastics and, and toxic chemicals. Uh, the center operates since 2009 as the cent uh, center of the Stockholm Convention, uh, which uh, for those who, don't, who do not know it, uh, is an international agreement involving 190 countries to fight against the generation of persistent organic pollutants, so POPs, um, that are highly polluting and toxic substances. Um, but we are also a center um, that is established uh, within the framework of the UNEP Mediterranean Action Plan. Um, that is the program of the UN environment established to support member countries of the Barcelona Convention for the protection of the marine environment and, and coastal region of the uh, Mediterranean. So uh, it is in these unique conjunctions of uh, mandates. So, uh, working on uh, toxic chemicals, but also operating to protect the, the marine environment and in particular the Mediterranean that um, we've, we find the opportunity to develop projects that combine both uh, mandates and in particular aiming at shedding the light you know, on the impact of uh, toxic additives uh, on the life cycle uh, management of plastics. Um, indeed, while we talk about a lot no, about uh, plastic pollution and, and uh, we all have in mind no, uh, images of uh, uh, turtle affected by uh, plastic bags, but um, additives also uh, are part of the issue. Uh, and they constitute the invisible part of this uh, plastic pollution issue. Therefore, we need also to um, strengthen communication on this issue. It's more difficult, but it's uh, really uh, needed to find uh, also and to address properly this, uh, this issue that is having a serious impact on uh, human health and the, the, the environment. Um, just to finish, uh, I would like to mention that this webinar is uh, being implemented in the framework of uh, the small uh, grant program funded by the BRS NORAD 2 project that is uh, managed by the um, Secretariat of the uh, Basel, Stockholm and Rotterdam uh, Convention that aim to uh, uh, improve the management of plastic waste, waste and ultimately to uh, contribute to uh, SDG uh, 14 and, and in particular the tar 
target 40.1 that's uh, aimed to prevent uh, significantly uh, well reduce marine pollution of all kinds uh, in particular from uh, land-based uh, activities so i will uh, stop here um, and i will give back the floor to my colleague uh, kim de miguel that is behind the scene for the the organization of this whole uh, uh, webinar. So she will introduce, introduce further the topic and, and the or dear uh, guest speaker for today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Magali. Okay, well, I will just uh, briefly uh, set the scene for today's session. As you know, this is a webinar series uh, called the understanding of the circular economy for chemicals in plastics. Um, the first session, so today's series is about textiles. So synthetic fiber textiles such as polyester are also plastics. They're used in multitude of applications, not just clothing. And here we're going to discuss today which are the hazardous chemicals that can be found in used textiles, as well as how these chemicals could be hampering the material recycling, something that obviously is very up and coming with the circular economy. And also we're going to be talking about textiles and how they're known for the low recycling rates and all Although more and more brands are taking responsibility to phase out these hazardous substances, um, we're going to look at uh, the chemical safety and how to boost recycling rates. So our first speaker joining us today is Dr. Harold Schonenberg. He has been working for about 35 years in the field of integrated industrial pollution prevention and control with a specific focus on the chemical, iron and steel and electroplating and textile industry. He has long lasting experience working with Asian and South American countries, and he is one of the leading European expert with respect to the Sevilla process. He's also standing professor at the University of Stuttgart in Germany and he is the chair of the Urban Water Management and Managing Director of the Institute of Sanitary Engineering, Water Quality and Solid Waste. That is a very long title. <laughs> okay, over to you, Harold. Please, if you can put up your presentation and you have uh, 15 minutes, I will be uh, letting you know when you have very little time left so you can move on to the conclusions. And to the rest of the speakers, just make sure to have your uh, microphone muted and your camera off. You can hear me properly now? Yes. Can oh. you start your video as well, please? Yes. OK, here Brilliant. we go. Thank you. So good morning to everybody. And I directly start with chemicals and textiles. I give you. No, I cannot click to the next. <laughs> I just tried to the click to click to the next uh, slide, but it does not work. Hmm. Um, I. Do you want to try? Yeah, presenting it again. Just closing and opening back again, just in case. Now it works. Okay. So sorry for this. Uh, so I give you a very short introduction and then we come to many chemicals which are contained in polyester, which is the most important synthetic fiber. And you will see that. And then we come to the efforts to prevent hazardous chemicals, recycling of polyester and some conclusions. And to, to show you that is the percentage of different fibers from the from 90, 70 until today, that means the past 50 years, and you see a dramatic change. And the dramatic change is because of polyester. So until about 2000, uh, cotton was the dominating fiber as a natural fiber, and then um, polyester increased um, exponentially. And it is today the absolute dominating fiber, as you see from this. And that's why I have chosen then polyester to demonstrate uh, what we have to take into account in terms of chemicals in polyester, at which part of the textile chain they are applied and so on, so that you get an overview. That is the objective of this presentation. Before doing so, we have also to be aware that, and that the consumption of textiles increased dramatically. It even decreased more than the population growth. So here you see the example that, for instance, uh, from 2000 to 
2015, it was a doubling of the consumption in terms of units um, of textile consumed. That is amazing. And um, now we have also the so-called fast fashion approach, which is ecologically sustainably terrible. That, and you know, there are people who buy a t-shirt just to wear it one, one time. And so that means uh, it is important to look at it because the increase of consumption of polyester is dramatic. We come to the so-called textile value added chain. This looks a little bit complex. So very quickly to show you that we start on the left hand side with a production of synthetic fibers, that means of polyester. Here is also indicated um, the natural fibers. Then we come to the fiber production to produce the yarn, the thread. Then we have the weaving and knitting. And then we come to the textile finishing. That means the wet textile processing. And we come to the garment making. And then it goes to the brands we know all and the retailers. And we have the use phase when we wear the garments and other when we use the textiles. And then we have also the end of life regime. And we want to come from the to the circular economy. And that's why when we want to recycle it, when we want to reuse polyester fibers, very often in blends with other fibers, what we have to take into account. At any stage of this textile value added chain, we have an input and the arrows from top means energy, water and chemicals. And that, and on the bottom, the arrows mean wastewater, waste gas and solid waste. So we have that at all stages and what you see in red are the so-called environmental hotspots. And this is about the, the growing of, of, um, of cotton and the textile finishing. And what very often is forgotten that the chemicals which are produced have a very high um, environmental pollution, especially the, the, the manufacture of dye stuffs and also especially the intermediates to produce the final dye stuffs. And that's why we have also hotspots there, one for the dye stuff, another one also for the optical brightness. So this so-called side chain, the production of chemicals used in the textile chain is often forgotten. And But today we will look at it. And I will come now to see the chemicals which are applied for the production of synthetic fibers then for the fiber production, for weaving, for textile finishing because all, at all these stages, chemicals are used and many of them remain on the polyester. And then we have to deal with it in the next steps if we want to recycle it. So polyester as such is high in consumption. We have seen it's the most important fiber today worldwide. We have seen we have a high energy consumption to produce it. The water consumption to produce this is not high, much less than compared to cotton, which you see on the left hand side. But let us concentrate now on polyester, which is produced basically from tephthalic acid and ethylene glycol. And then you see an, just an example of polyester, how it looks like then as a polymer. And when we produce that, and if we then process it to, to this loose fiber and to threads, we add already so-called preparations. So that is just for the mechanical processing of the fiber. And then we see for polyester, we have um, uh, lubricants, what we, what we apply and, and which is uh, then five to 10 gram per kilogram of textile substrate, that means of kilogram polyester. And here we have already ionic and anionic surfactants, but also then short chain alkyl phosphates, antistatic agents, uh, which are diesters of phosphorus pentoxides and so on. We have then for so-called texturized, sorry, texturized uh, filament yarns, we have an additional um, input of, of chemicals. And here, Harald, you mute it. You you need to unmute. Yeah, um, I don't know how that happened. Then we have four. Then we have further um, 
for preparation of, of the fiber. We have phosphoric acid, esters, and also fatty acid at oxalates. And then for fur further to, if you wind it up, we have coning oils and we have also warping oils and whisting oils. And all of them are then on the polyester fiber. When it comes to usually wet processing very often, then part of that, what we have seen is then removed, but not all of it. But that is um, to take into account that we know already what type of chemicals are on the polyester. Then on the next, wow, again, now it's not working. I want to go to the next slide and it does not work. Wow, okay, I have to stop again. I'm sorry for this, but I... No worries, maybe you can just go back to the slide where you were. Okay, now it works. Thank you. So yes. Then we, when we do the dyeing, we add. Of course, we want to dye, and when we when we do dyeing, we need the dye stuff. So we come to that in the next slide. And for certain uh, dyeing processes, we have also dyeing accelerators. They are also called carriers. And that today, if you do it properly, it is only needed if you have blends of wool and polyester because polyester is usually dyed at high temperature, 130 degree. And then you don't need the dyeing accelerate accelerators, but if you have cotton, uh, if you have wool, you cannot uh, go beyond 100 degrees Celsius. So you only need these carriers and you have, if you are lucky, capoxylic acid esters and thalamide and fatty alcohol polyglycol, polyglycol derivatives, but still in Asia, Methyl naphthalene based um, carriers are used, and even trichlorobenzene can be still used. It was also used in Europe for a very long time, or biphenyl, autophenyl, autophenyl phenol, or benzyl alcohol derivatives are used, but only in case of wool. Then, when we come to the dyes, if you want to recycle, polyester, we have to be aware that the add-on the, of dye stuffs and for polyester only so-called dispersed dyes are used, which you see here, small molecules, most of them are acid dyes or endrochinone dyes as a chromophoric group, what you see here. And the add-on is 0.1 to 10 weight percent. If you have a very dark black shade, for instance, you may have one, 10, weight percent of dye stuff, that means 100 gram per kilogram of dye stuff you have then in the fiber. And that, of course, is the most important by, by weight, the most important chemicals which are in the polyester fibers. So we have to aware of that. Um, of course, dispersed dyes are non-biodegradable as all synthetic dyes are. They also can contain organically bound halogens, it can be sensitizing and, okay, that is more for, they have high fixation rates so that uh, the water pollution is not that high if you die with that. And, but what we have also that the dispersing agents which are applied are partly also on the poly, remain poly, partly on the polyester and most of them are non-biodegradable. Another thing we have to consider when we, think about polyester and recycling is that for the polymerization process, antimony, antimony is used as a catalyst. And in the fibers today, we have around, it varies, 300 ppm. Uh, part of it is reused, is, is removed, practically extracted during the high temperature dyeing process. So maybe 30 to 50% is then removed and is discharged with wastewater from dyeing, but still 50 to 70% remain on the polyester fibers. And this has also to be considered when we do recycling. Then UV absorber for polyester are, are applied. And that is an important benzotriazole derivative which is still offered, which is still you can buy in the market, although it is now proposed by the POPs review committee as a POP and it is 
the first maybe non-halogenated compound which is now discussed to become a persistence organic pollutant according to the Stockholm Convention. And the POPs properties according to Annex D of the Stockholm Conven Convention is already confirmed. So we have to take this compound also into account. Uh, if it is applied, I have two sources. I found two sources. So it's about 0.2 to 0.8 weight percent on the fiber. So it is not negligible. The poly and perfluorinated alkyl substances can be an issue um, if they are applied for water repellency or oil repellency or stain repellency on textiles. On the normal textiles we wear like shirts or t-shirts, it is not there, but whenever you have an outdoor and um, where you need water repellency and oil repellency, that also means uh, professional wear, um, workwear, or then you can have the PFAS, so we have to consider that. It is uh, more specific for specific textiles, but it is the issue, of course, is there, and there are hundreds of articles in the meantime on PFAS in textiles. What you also can have in polyester, this is an example um, for technical textile that you have flame retardants. So that is a phosphor organic flame retardant, which is non-biodegradable. We are just working on that uh, about the biodegradability to test it again, to be really sure. But as far as we know, it is not. And that is then also in, in, the, in the range of two weight percent on the textile. Of course, that is now then in a technical textile, for instance, in, a, in the interior of cars uh, that could be applied as a flame retardant. So when it comes to considering all these things, uh, of course, we, you all know the Stockholm Convention, the Rotterdam and Basel Convention, and uh, also, also ILO Convention. And we have natural legislation. And what is very important is also from societal initiatives, Greenpeace had in 2011, 2012, 2013, a big campaign on textiles. And there was a very strong and lasting answer from industry. And that is zero discharge of hazardous chemicals, set the HC, what you see here on the right. And about 170 international um, companies like Adidas, Nike, Puma, uh, then all the brands um, are have created this initiative, which is a very positive thing. And they, it's an industry driven industry driven initiative, but it is um, it is moving very fast. And I think they do a very good job. And it's the first time that we have now a global somehow regulation of chemicals and also wastewater created by such an industry driven initiative, SETI-HC, Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals. What I said, it was initiated by the Greenpeace campaign and it was really amazing to see that industry said, okay, we see the point of Greenpeace, we need to answer them. And that's why then they really created this uh, initiative, SETI-HC. The approach is, if you see now in this figure, um, a textile finishing industry, what you see here in the middle, and you have an input of water, you have an input of chemicals, you have an input of energy, and you have also the outputs. What is important now is that the chemicals which go in for textile wet processing, that they don't contain certain hazardous chemicals, because if, there is no hazardous chemicals in the input. In the input, there is no hazardous chemicals on the textile product, nor on the in the wastewater, nor in the sludge coming from wastewater. And that is the so-called MRSL approach, manufacturing restricted substances list. That means all the chemicals which are used for production for manufacturing of textiles should not contain certain hazardous chemicals. And that's why it is called the zero discharge of hazardous chemicals approach. And this MRSL is important to have. 
And it is also then that you see that the RSL, maybe you know, some of you know the RSL, this uh, was an approach earlier that you have a restricted substances list in the textile products. And the MRSL is going beyond and saying, okay, why not, why just to look at the final textile product, we look at the chemistry and on the chemicals going into the process and avoid it there. And then we have also no difficulties with pollutants on the textile substrate as such. So when we now come to the recycling, um, and today very little of polyester uh, is recycled. It is far less than 10%. I found uh, I was one colleague told me it maybe it's for polyester as to reuse it really as, as a fiber, as a chemical is maybe 1%. So we are on the start. Uh, to improve the recycling that also then goes into the design of products so that we have better options than to recycle it. And we have seen that many chemicals are applied and they turn out to be a problem when you start to recycle it, especially if you do just, if you really want to regain fibers, that means that you have also chemical recycling. So and that is the issue what you see on the bottom left, um, what about all the chemicals on the polyester fibers, especially dye stuffs, of course, but also the PFAS, but also the antimony, maybe some flame retardants and so on. So this we have to look into and that's why I, I was talking about this today. So the issue of chemicals applied in the textile chain is explained by means of polyester, but the same is true for all the other fibers. But as I said in the beginning, polyester is a dominating fiber, so it's most important for this fiber. And these chemicals can have a negative impact on the recycling and we have to consider them. So that was the purpose of this, that I tried to give you an overview and that you know a little bit more about polyester and the chemicals applied. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Harold, for your intervention. Super interesting. We've learned about non-biodegradable dyes. That is also um, interesting. I've learned so much <laughs> just in this session. Um, we've also heard about PFAS in polyester, and that is found in consumer apparel, professional and home textiles. I don't know if all of the audience here joining us today knew about this, but it's definitely something to be aware of. and. Um, this links us really well into our next presentation. We have, oh, sorry, before I had a question for you. Um, do you think we can end fast fashion? And if so, how long do you think it's going to take us? Do you see this happening in the next 10 to 20 years at all? Harold? <laughs> um, I, I think we, we cannot end it as long as it is not regulated. I mean, still we have a so-called free market. If you can do that, and if people buying it, you can do it. Yeah. So you so you can sell as long as it is according to the regulations, chemically wise, you can sell any product. That is the system we have so far. And if um, uh, I I still remember times where we had two collections of of textiles per year, and then it was four, then every month. And now uh, some brands, they, they issue even every two weeks, new, um, we have new collection, you can <laughs> come and buy. So I don't think so, that we can stop it unless it is really done um, legally. Okay, thank you for your answer, Harold. I see Roland, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I have one question to uh, Harald um, about the PFAS. Uh, are they covalently bound um, to the polyester or is this a kind of additive or is this a kind of uh, polymeric blend uh, which is put on the uh, polyester fiber? Um, I, I think they use, uh, the, they use PFAS, which are, again, uh, non-polar as a polyester fiber is. 
the same is true for the for the dispersed dyes. So that means you migrate it thermally into the fiber. So it is not a covalent bond as it is, for instance, for reactive dyes. Yeah. Um, so it is just um, a thermal fixation of them, but it is not a chemical bond. Okay, so therefore they can be released then in further yeah. life cycle. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, question and answer very briefly there. We're going to move on to our next presentation, which is uh, regrettable substitution and insights into the PFAS movement. Teresa Kill, if you can please put your camera on. Thank you so much. So Teresa is a senior policy advisor at the NGO ChemSec with a, a focus on chemical policy and circularity. She has many years of collaborations with the companies on chemicals management, along with a background in policy making from municipal to international level. ChemSec specializes in highlighting positive company examples, finding balanced solutions that benefit human health and the environment. So over to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and thank you so much for inviting me to this event. Uh, and for the previous presentation, which was brilliant, and I, I really appreciated that. Let's see if I can now share my screen and my presentation. This is always interesting to see if it works. Let's see here. Do you see my screen and my presentation? I guess you'll scream yeah. if you don't. <laughs> okay. So I do work for uh, the environmental NGO ChemSec. Um, our focus is to reduce the use of hazardous substances, and we do this by collaborating with companies. And as you already said, uh, highlighting the positive examples, showing what's possible, uh, showing this to policymakers, trying to uh, find legislation uh, that is workable for progressive companies while also beneficial for human health and the environment. So we do have a lot of discussions with the policymakers, uh, but we also base a lot of what we do with the conversations that we have with different businesses. Uh, another a uh, leg that we stand on is our work with investors because we realize that it's very important um, to bring this perspective into our work. Um, so we advise investors on um, the risks with investing in companies that produce uh, hazardous substances. And to be real honest, uh, most investors don't care that much about um, the environment per se, but it is a financial risk to invest in, in this type of production. And therefore we advise them on how to post questions and, and yeah, what to look for. Uh, we also have a number of online tools that are free and you're very welcome to use them. Um, you can go find them on our website and I'll present a few of them right now, briefly. Our most known one is the Sing List, which you probably have heard of, um, even if you haven't heard of us at ChemSec, it's our list. It's more known than we are, and that's, that's a very good thing. Uh, it is a list of substances uh, that can help companies and authorities to prioritize on substitution. We have about a thousand substances on this list right now, and they it is hazard based. And it's like it's this um, a mirroring of uh, what should be on the reach candidate list. So uh, substances of very high concern that we have identified. Um, the other um, tools, I will not go into detail, but there is the similarity uh, to avoid regrettable substitution. We have marketplace, which could be very interesting for a lot of the, the brands showing up today, uh, where we market, well, not the we, but alternative producers market their uh, solutions. And it can be a drop in substance for a substance of very high concern, or it can be an alternative uh, technology. And we do have a lot on textiles uh, in specific, um, and uh, I would say 
that uh, the, our most thorough contribution at the moment is alternatives to PFAS in textiles. So that's very interesting. That's on Marketplace. Um, we have a textile guide that is intended to help SMEs, but we also have seen that, that some big brands are using it. Um, so I'll, I'll go on because I have so much to speak about today. <laughs> Uh, so we collaborate with a lot of brands. Um, we don't take money from them. That's very important to, to state because then we couldn't keep our independence. Um, but at the core of this collaboration, we have uh, the companies in our business group that you see on the screen today. And uh, what we do with these companies is that we have in-depth discussions about substitution and circularity, all with a chemical perspective. Uh, but like I said, we also have uh, collaborations with a lot of other brands on a daily basis. So what we do when we collaborate with brands could be, for instance, something we did two weeks ago, uh, we released a paper on transparency. Uh, we've seen that the Commission has committed very thoroughly to what is called um, the, the Circular Economy Action Plan, and also the chemical strategy. And in the chemical strategy, it says a lot of very, very good things. It says, for instance, that, that consumer products should be free from toxic substances and many other promises. But one of them is that they want to support front runners. And they realize that it is more expensive to go beyond regulation to be the first movers. And we had in-depth discussions with uh, companies and the commission and we realized that what the companies really really need is more information on the chemicals in their own products because we know and you know that it is very difficult to get that information from suppliers and so this is why we urge the commission together with these seven companies that are listed here um, to increase the incentives for suppliers to provide information on chemical content in your products, because we know that that's very difficult. This is something that we do. And we know that this, these types of initiatives have a very uh, good um, uh, effect on policymakers because they very often hear the, the, the laggards, they hear the, for the, of, of the ones that cannot or do not want to move. Uh, but these are the other ones, and you recognize a few of them, I know. I also want to talk a bit about um, a report that we did a while back. It's called What Goes Around. And the reason that I do that is because I want to link you know, the textiles and, and the circularity. Um, in this report, we wanted to show the chemical um, perspective of recycled material. And we chose two different uh, material streams as case studies. We chose uh, plastic packaging and textiles, and they are very, very different, but it was interesting to, to look a bit deeper into both of them. So in this report, we go into the, the legal background, the, uh, the general chemical background of, of what the problems are, and also what the solutions could be, uh, traceability uh, and other things. And what we saw was that, um, I mean, chemicals is a major roadblock when it comes to using more recycled material. And so many brands are looking for more recycled material to use in the product. We know that. Um, and this is also why there is such a huge market potential. If this material would be free from hazardous substances, the potential market would be enormous. Uh, we also looked into what was already mentioned um, as chemical recycling. We choose to call it non-mechanical recycling, not to create um, misperceptions. But what we see is that um, this type of recycling is completely immature. Um, and it is not wise to believe that at this point, this could be a solution for these enormous amounts of, of um, waste. I mean, we know that textiles, we only 
we only recycle about 1% of all the textiles, which is a real problem. So we need to go at this with several solutions, but the mechanical recycling is the only viable option at this moment and I foresee in the foreseeable future. And I'm really happy to discuss this with, with you guys, uh, but that will take another hour, so I won't do that today. Um, and what we also see is that it is really important to collaborate uh, in order to create non-toxic waste streams at this moment, because the, the general um, waste streams are not non-toxic. So where we see the positive examples is where we find collaborations between sometimes expected, sometimes unexpected partners. Uh, we created a few policy recommendations uh, for this to be become reality. And of course, it is always most beneficial to solve the problem in the beginning and not try to uh, fix it at the end. So to phase out the hazardous substances with the help of legislation is the most important thing. And that's what we need to focus on the most. Also very important is to, uh, to keep the same, um, uh, the same levels on, uh, on requirements on, on, on uh, virgin and recycled material. Otherwise, it will not be interesting for, um, for brands to use it because they would risk their rep reputation. That's, that's not going to happen. Transparency of information, really, really important. Also with recycled material, of course, but even more difficult because how do you know what's in it? Um, and also the definition of recycled must be clear. And this is where we get into the problems of... Um, of non-mechanical recycling or advanced recycling, uh, chemical recycling. Uh, another study that I want to highlight, and unfortunately I cannot take credit for it because I, I wasn't the creator of it. I've been consulted and been part of presenting it, but it is a study that was initiated by H&M and Ikea that I, I really think is great. Uh, then some other brands jumped on as well, where they gathered, um, recycled fabrics uh, in different parts of the world to analyze what can we find in there. They started out with uh, cotton fibers um, and then at the second stage they also added wool and polyester which is what I, I will talk about today. Um, so what I, what I really, I mean the, the results are really important but to show that it's possible to collaborate on this, I think is the most important thing. Uh, and that it's impossible for even big brands like these to do it on their own. We need to gather more information and we need to do it together and be generous about sharing. Um, so they created a database, which I think is really interesting where you can share the, the data without disclosing who analyzed it. And just to be very clear, it's not that these brands collected their own fabrics only, but it was from, you know, from, from the general batches. So it's from all different kinds of brands the textiles come from. So uh, there are interesting um, results from cotton and wool, but I will only talk about polyesters because that's what we're discussing today. Um, so we had 169 samples and out of these, more than half of them had something in them that was too high, uh, product, uh, um, chemical group or something. And the list that they, that they used was the list from a firm that I'm sure that many of you are, are familiar with. Just to be clear that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to know what should you analyze. So that's why they chose that. Uh, and only 17 out of these 169 showed no detection of any of those substances. So that's quite low. Uh, and I listed, but not in, uh, in a, uh, uh, an order, uh, the most important ones that failed, the, the ones that failed the most. And I think it's interesting to see here the BPA problematic group with uh, bisphenols in general, um, cadmium and DHP. I mean, DHP is a substance where 
we know that there are alternatives. So why do we find it in here? Uh, we have discussed today already uh, the problem with PFAS uh, and flame retardants. And in general, they didn't find it here, but that doesn't mean it's not there. But the reason is that they collaborated very thoroughly with the recyclers so that they separated all the uh, outdoor garments and all the, the different um, uh, professional uh, clothing and all of that. So that is why I believe we don't see it in these samples. It's not that it's not there in general. So that also shows that separating is very important. Um, the main takeaways from this from my side uh, is, of course, again, chemical content is a major roadblock and uh, do right from the beginning and do not substitute with something, do not substitute BPA with BPS or BPF because it's not going to help. Another important thing is that not all materials should be recycled. And I know this is very hard to accept, but it is the truth. And a lot of material, for instance, wool is in my uh, books, absolutely Im immature as material for recycling at this stage and establish interesting uh, collaborations. So uh, I was asked to talk about our PFAS movement today. And this is interesting uh, as we started it uh, two and a half years ago, and it was right at the, at the time that the movie Dark Waters was released and they had a showing of it in the EU parliament and we were about to speak there. And we had realized that we talked to so many brands that wanted to phase out PFAS, but they couldn't because they couldn't find alternatives and uh, they didn't want regrettable substitution. Um, and then we, we, we started the PFAS movement where we gather companies that either have phased out PFAS already or would really like to do that and see it as a problem and see the group as a problem. So they want to push policymakers to regulate this on a group level thoroughly. Um, and uh, here you see a few of the brands that have joined already. I asked uh, my colleague yesterday and she said we now have 80 companies and a lot of them uh, tend to be from the textile industry. And one reason is, of course, what we'd already heard uh, from the detox campaign and CDHC that we see so many things happening, uh, such a good development in, in uh, the textile sector. And this is also why we have found a lot of alternatives that you can find on our marketplace, for instance. But we know that brands are still struggling and this is why they want to join. And I would invite you all to consider this and, and contact us if, if you are interested, because there are many things to, to gain from this from your side. Uh, I mean, you get a lot of information, you get uh, access to webinars that we do. Uh, and like I said, we don't charge uh, for what we do. Um, it also really helps to push policymakers in the right direction. So I I'm happy to present it to you. And if you have further questions, um, we are very, very happy to answer them. It has been one of our most successful uh, initiatives so far. Um, yes, I already talked about this. Um, I think this marks the end of my presentation that I had like this, but uh, let's see, I'll stop sharing. Uh, and I wanted to share with you that yesterday, um, no, two days ago, sorry, uh, we released a little movie uh, about uh, the RP fast movement that I asked if I could show today. It's just three minutes, so I hope you can enjoy it. We've had a wonderful three-day seminar, haven't we? Yeah. yeah, we have. And now it's time for the final act. We have the number one non-stick chemical. Give it up a P first. Yeah. Yeah. Are you in here?
Come on, baby, it's your time. I don't know, baby. I don't feel that good. Come on, baby, you got this. Nobody's ever beaten B-Foss before. Well, I mean, you got at least one fan whose heart is beating for you. Wait, wait, wait. It looks like Kemsek's in the Sorry. building. Sorry. It took you so long. Kemsek is here. Give it up for Kemsek. Okay, B-Foss, you go first. Yo, I'm P-Fast, the illest chemical in town If you're battling with me, you're bound to go down I'm used to the products from A to Z I'm in your mama's frying pan and your sister's TV Ken Sack, we staff with a name I nerdy tech that hits the roof and guess what? You're to blame, it's a shame You're so lame and you suck at his game This guy's so square, he belongs in the frame <laughs> He's choking. Come on, man, you got this. Yeah, you sure had some shit on your plus list. And you write that on square, that's a good this. But there's something PFOS ain't telling you. Don't buy all them lives that he's selling you. Y'all, he's manslaughtered via tab water. Persistent, and stay around from mother to granddaughter. See, he goes from groceries and goes overseas to kill ovaries. Listen, yo, I ask myself, how can that chemical that lethal be in 99% of all people? That's a true fact. How do I know? I saw dark waters with Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> Yeah. You say that we can, but we can do. What we need to do is to ban you and your fam too. Spreading information to the brands too. Making them away and not demand you. Hey yo, this is a joint effort to make an improvement. So saddle up folks and join the movement. Join the movement, join the movement. Saddle up folks and join the movement. Join the movement, join the movement. Saddle up folks and join the movement. Join the movement, join the movement. Saddle up folks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and now questions, I, I hope. Yes, thank you so much, Teresa. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, yes, thank you so much. That video is extraordinary. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> it's, I'm sure it's gonna be quite a revolution. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have any questions aside from, um, can we get the movie? Can we get the movie? Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> I can I can post it in the chat, but you can also find it on LinkedIn and, and um, Twitter. And it's always helpful if you like it and spread it. Uh, but I, I will post the, the links here in the chat. Thank you so much, Teresa. Maybe Roland? one question. Yeah. Yes. Maybe one question. So when you look to the uh, uh, global uh, regulatory frame, um, in, in Europe, I think there is, um, they are going to think on, on doing a group approach for PFAS. Yeah. How is it in, in other regions? And uh, maybe if you want to add something on this group approach uh, in, in the EU where you see where it's standing. Yes, uh, it is a very uh, valid point. Um, in the EU, there are five countries that have gone together uh, to start what's called a dossier uh, to ban PFAS as a group in basically all consumer products. Uh, it's a very long and quite tiresome process to go through uh, and they have just been postponing it a bit so they plan to, um, to, to send it in uh, beginning of next year if I am not mistaken I could be wrong right now it should have been now but they had to postpone it a bit. Uh, but the idea is to do that, to ban it as a group. But of course, uh, they are now looking into um, what alternatives are available, what does it look like, and also the different types of, of uh, product categories. But I know that as we're talking about textiles, 
uh, I've discussed thoroughly with the dossier holder on the textiles part, which is Sweden. Um, and there seems to be um, evidence that there is a very good um, base for, for alternatives when it comes to uh, textiles, which is what we see as well. But always there is the question of functionality. So what, what do you mean by substituting? Is it, the, is it the, the water repellents or is it also the stain repellents? You know, that, that's, that's always a, a question. But in general, for textiles, there are alternatives, you, you might say, for almost all uses. Um, so I do believe that we will see a ban on the family uh, as far as you can. Uh, but it takes some time. And we also know that the um, regulation in Europe is European, but it does have uh, effect on the world because, of course, most brands, they don't want to produce for, for just one single market um, and have uh, separate production lines. Some do, but most don't. And we see that if we regulate something in the EU, it has huge effect on the rest of the world as well. Okay. Good. Thanks. You're muted. Uh, Kim, you are muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that leads us on to our next presentation. Um, circular tex textiles and options to control hazardous chemicals. So, um, Roland, you can stay connected and put up your presentation. Roland has done a research on persistent organic pollutants, POPs, for 28 years. He works as an international consultant, mainly for UN organizations like UNEP, UNIDO, UNDP, and the Secretariat of the Stockholm Convention, and environmental ministries on the implementation of the Stockholm Convention on POPs. He is the author of the Stockholm Convention Guidance on POPs in Products and Recycling, which also considers textiles, and he has published more than 170 papers in scientific journals. Thank you so much, Roland. You can go ahead. You see my slide? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, thanks for invitation. Yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, good evening uh, to Australia. We have at least one person from Australia. Um, the topic is circular textiles, options to control hazardous chemicals, uh, but also I put a, a big question mark to it, and uh, you will see during the presentation uh, that we have options, but that we have also big question marks. We have heard from the last two presentations that the um, recycling rate of textiles is very low, so also the fashion industry is aware of that, so in 2017, uh, the industry uh, committed itself uh, to a transition to a more circular fashion system. And for that, they have uh, outlined different action points, including, for example, implementing design strategies for cyclability. This means what uh, Harald said in the first presentation to phase out, for example, uh, chemicals which hamper recycling, uh, but also uh, a main point is increasing the share of garment and footwear made from recycled post-consumer textile. And therefore we will see in future an increase of recycling of textiles. There are different uh, methods uh, of uh, reuse and uh, recycling of textiles. Here is an, an, an overview. Um, one is very important is the, is the reuse and the repurposing of textiles. Another is uh, the normal uh, recycling of fibers uh, by uh, mechanical recycling and chemical recycling. We will come to it. Uh, but also one option uh, for recycling is uh, composting garments, which are biological uh, degradable, like uh, cotton or um, viscose. But for all these um, approaches, we have to think about the fate of hazardous chemicals for the individual options. Yeah? And you have now seen in the last two presentations the, the list of chemicals and also, let's say, the, the, the content, yeah? sometimes in the, in the percent range. Uh, and just now, uh, the last what I said, composting. Yeah? This means if you put a fiber into composting, 
uh, and the fiber degrades, but you have then a kind of dyes or other additives which are not degrading. So they are then finally ending uh, in the compost. And I have not seen for the preparation of this presentation, I have not seen any study about composting of uh, textiles in respect to uh, chemical pollution. Uh, I would like to start uh, here with the, with the reuse uh, and uh, here repurposing uh, with two examples. And one example is the reuse repurposing of textiles of tents. So tents are frequently treated with hazardous flame retardant to reduce the fire risk in the tents and also with PFAS to repel the water. So therefore care is needed uh, in the end of life management of tent fabric. Uh, but when you look into the internet, uh, you will find uh, a variety of suggestions to consumer for repurpose and recycling of tent fabrics. Uh, one example is lining your child school bag. This means you put the flame retardants, the PFAS directly in your school bag of the child uh, with related exposure to books uh, or even the, the lunch which you put there. Another uh, proposal is uh, for arts and crafts. So uh, let children express their artistic flair, mean the children then directly handle uh, this textile. Other proposal is as ground sheets. So here the proposal is rather than restricting your child's access to carpeted areas, use tent as a ground sheet. Tent fabric is perfect barrier between kids and carpeting. Another proposal is to make table protectors. So there you directly put these uh, textiles, including the chemicals on your table. Further uh, proposal is a mattress protector. Um, so here you put uh, the fabric and the chemicals directly in, in, in your bed uh, or here um, for, for storage, uh, even the proposal is for directly for uh, lunch and food. Yeah. And so you see here that we have proposals to uh, repurpose here a, a textile um, with high exposure risk, which should be assessed and um, avoided. Um, when we look to the exposure, because you might ask yourself, uh, do we have then, if we have prominated flame retardant here on the tent uh, and we touch it, do we have really an exposure? So there is uh, one study from 2018 from uh, the Herald Group from Birmingham, uh, which have assessed furniture textiles as a major exposure pathway for hexabromocyclododecan. So uh, here, they have uh, evaluated uh, really with a, with, a, with, a, with a real skin um, if they uh, get an exposure and if uh, the uh, hexabromocyclododecan is uh, directly uh, going, wait a moment, I show here my laser pointer, directly going um, through the skin and they have found that a major exposure here uh, for the HBCD of consumer is a textile. There is a difference between summer exposure and winter exposure because it depends how much uh, skin you have exposed. Uh, and also what you see is that there is a high exposure from the ingestion of dust, but also from the house dust, the main hexabromocyclodecan come from textile. So therefore for hexabromocyclodecan for the flame retardant here, uh, this study shows that textile is really a, a relevant exposure pathway here. Also, hexabromocyclodecan is a pop and bioaccumulates in, in food. Uh, here, the exposure is considerably lower compared to the other uh, exposure pathways. And what I find, um, or what I would like to highlight is that this study in 2018 is the first study after 40 years of exposure of brominated flame retardants uh, from textiles. Uh, and it's from the research community, so maybe the industry have done some studies, but there is really no publications on it. Um, and I think that uh, this needs to be uh, considerably improved. A second example for the repurposing is on carpets. For carpets, we even know more on the pollutants. There are good studies 
uh, in Europe, in um, also in the US about uh, pollutants in carpets. So here carpets sold in the European Union can contain more than uh, 50 hazardous substances, including flame retardants, PFAS, phthalates, you name it. Uh, among these identified substances, there are carcinogens, mutagens, uh, chemicals toxic for reproduction and also endocrine disrupting chemicals. From these nine, um, more than 50 substances, 10 are identified by the European Union as substances of very high concern and four are already on the authorization list and are banned. Um, so here the exposure to toxic substances can take place also via inhalation, ingestion and dermal contact. And for all the carpets, I have not found any study for the brominated flame retardants, but there is a recent study on exposure to carpets from PFAS. And uh, this study is uh, from, the, from the US and the, the studies they have conducted in childcare centers and they have gathered um, dust and uh, looked to the carpet. And what you see is that um, um, most of the dust was contaminated with, with PFAS and that the source of this PFAS and the dust and in the exposure to the child uh, was mainly uh, from the carpet um, and uh, the exposure was relevant. So when we now look to the repurposing of carpets, also I have uh, Googled the, the, the internet uh, for the suggestions of internet platforms. And one suggestion coming from different um, uh, websites is that you can reuse the carpet in garden or allotments. So here, if you put the carpet with PFAS on your garden, the PFAS are released into your garden and because they are uh, fully persistent, they will stay in your garden and because they are mobile, they are moving into fruits and into vegetables. Also another proposal is upcycling of carpets in compost insulation. So old carpets is perfect for keeping your compost insulated. Um, but also here, the PFAS will be released uh, with other chemicals into your compost uh, and finally can accumulate in fruits and vegetables. But there is uh, no study on this. I have seen that we have some researchers here. So one proposal is really, I mean, look into this topic. It's really a big topic and a relevant topic. Other proposals for repurposing is uh, upholstery headboards of beds or pillow cover. Also here, I think you are increasing the exposure uh, of these chemicals um, into uh, the, uh, for, for consumers. So also here, the exposure risk which should be assessed and, in my opinion, avoided. Now uh, we look uh, into recycling options. Here we have uh, two major possibilities, mechanical recycling and chemical recycling. Only one slide about mechanical recycling and challenges of hazardous additives. First, definition of mechanical recycling. It's a process used in a recycling system based on physical forces. This means only by physical forces you separate here the, the fibers, which may be used in isolation for fabric or fabric recycling or as a pre-processing step. So here for this mechanical recycling, hazardous chemicals like flame retardants, PFAS, dyes and others uh, present in the textile products can likely not be removed in mechanical recycling processes and stay in the output. There are no sorting technologies for the pollutants itself. So there are only automatic sorting for fibers, fiber types and uh, colors. Uh, we heard in the last uh, presentation uh, that uh, when they did the, the assessment uh, of chemicals uh, that they did not find uh, much PFAS and brominated flame retardants. So here, um, yes, by a pre-sorting of these kind of tents or carpets, or uh, let's say uniforms, uh, it might be possible to do this kind of uh, um, um, pre-depollution steps. Um, if you don't do that, then uh, it will create risk to exposure of workers and com consumers. But there is a lack of research and data in respect to mechanical recycling and chemicals. And uh, also, uh, we have seen that there are different pops or uh, chemicals which are listed 
under uh, reach. So here, by recycling, there is a risk uh, for non-compliance of, of legislation. And uh, if there would be then assessments, uh, like we saw in the last presentation, there is also a risk of a negative perception of the quality of recycled textiles and fibers of customers if we bring these chemicals finally uh, into new recycled products. Some of the additives can result in problems during thermomechanical recycling. I give you one example, that's uh, the phosphorus flame retardants. Uh, some of them, uh, when uh, it is together with, with metals like antimony, they can degrade and can generate phosphoric acids and cause hydrolysis of the polymer chain. So uh, this is from the, this EU a commission study on recycling uh, and mentioned here for textiles, but also I know that uh, for electronic waste recycling, there is the same uh, challenge. Coming now to uh, chemical recycling processes for textiles. The definition of it is a process using chemical dissolution or chemical reaction, which is employed in polymer or monomer recycling. There are two major possibilities for chemical recycling. We have the, the monomer recycling, uh, where the system breakdown, the polymeric textile, finally we get the monomers back and then we uh, repolymerize. Or um, polymer recycling, this means uh, we have a chemical process which uh, disassembly or dissolve uh, the, the fibers, uh, but do not degrade the fibers itself and finally extract uh, the polymers for respinning. There are three major technologies uh, which can be identified in this respect and which are used uh, in industrial scale. We have a monomer recycling of uh, nylon or the uh, PA6, polyamide 6, or the polyester PET. Um, here, uh, to degrade uh, into oligomers or monomers, as a second, we have polymer recycling of cotton and viscose. Yeah, viscose comes from cotton via a pulping process. And we have uh, upcoming technologies focusing on the recovery of both cellulose and uh, polyester or PET uh, from uh, polycotton plants. Yeah, and you see that the last would be a kind of a silver bullet because if you could from uh, textile waste recycle both uh, major uh, fibers, uh, cotton and uh, polyester, it would be uh, great. And I will give you for each of the three now um, uh, an example. First coming to chemical monomer recycle of polyester and, and nylon. So chemical recycling via depolymerization implies that the polymer chains are completely broken down to monomers. And uh, then uh, after you have the monomer or already there, um, when you do then a distillation of this monomer, you have for sure a good step which can uh, remove uh, pollutants and which can depollute. Yeah, so here you have a big advantage uh, of these uh, processes that um, the legacy chemicals can be phased out in this step. Um, in theory, many polymers can be depolymerized, but practically processes at the moment are only polyester and, and nylon-6. At the moment, for example, uh, nylon-6-6 um, is not um, depolymerized and also the, the other ones not but I am certain that industry is looking into this, but at the moment we have only here the polyester and the, the nylon, uh, which are really recycled by depolymerization. In theory, um, here uh, nylon and uh, polyester textiles can serve as an input, but in practice today is that only PET or polyester uh, from post-consumer food packaging, this means PET bottles are recycled. Yeah? At the moment, PET textiles is not recycled. This is still under development, yeah? and probably because of these uh, uh, pollutant additives. Yeah? So also here, one good message. At the moment, the recycled uh, polyester or PET come from food-grade uh, materials, and therefore, let's say the input is uh, relatively clean. Uh, when we look to, to nylon uh, or PA6, 
Uh, it's mainly from post-consumer uh, carpets, fishing nets, and industrial waste. So here uh, it is uh, pre-treated. We have the depolymerization, post-treatment, uh, monomer oligomers, and repolymerization. Um, and here we have uh, one full-scale process uh, that's uh, established from Aquafil. It's called Econyl. It's a full-scale process uh, developed here by this Italian uh, company. So nylon waste is collected over the world, uh, including carpets, uh, fishing nets. Um, it's important to have more than 80% uh, polyester, uh, but we have seen in the last presentation that the separation is even better. So normally you might achieve 90%. And then this waste is depolymerized, depolymerized to caprolactam. And uh, then there is a distillation step of caprolactam uh, removing pollutants. Um, and also this yarn is already used uh, since some years. Um, actually, a company started uh, somehow 2011 uh, with this process. And uh, also one uh, good news is when you look here to the carbon footprint, uh, the recycled, um, fiber has a lower carbon footprint and what you see here over the years so the the new virgin has a carbon footprint of 12 kilograms and already when they did their first uh, recycling in 2011 their footprint was 7.5 kilogram of uh, co2 equivalent per kilogram and over the years of improving their process you see they come down uh, with the ecological carbon footprint uh, in their process, so optimize the process. Yeah, uh, not really included is here. I mean, all the gathering, um, but at least here for the process, uh, it is uh, overall better. Second example is the recycling of uh, cotton or viscose or rayon. Uh, here, I give you the example of uh, the so-called infina infinite fiber, the infina uh, developed in in Finland here from the. VTT Technical Research Center in Finland. So the Infina fiber is recycled fiber uh, produced from cotton rich textiles. So here also they need normally more than 50% uh, cotton. Otherwise uh, it is, uh, let's say, um, really not commercially viable. But also here you have seen that after separation, it should be easy to uh, be above the 50%. So um, a carbamide cellulose dissolution technique is used. So this comes from the pipe industry. So this is anyway known uh, in full scale. And uh, this is used here to remove the polyester residues. But also in this step, you can also remove other pollutants. Uh, but also here, we have not seen a real study in the, on the assessment of pollutant intake and uh, pollutant out. Also this process, has 33% uh, less CO2 equivalent compared to uh, the virgin process and uses 98% less water. Also the process here for the fit from Finland avoids uh, some harmful chemicals, especially highlighting the carbon di disulfide, which is openly used in the production of uh, cotton, cotton and, and viscose. And uh, already here products are, are on the market here one example, the, the jeans, and also these jeans is price competitive. Yeah, so you see, uh, yes, cotton uh, recycling, chemical recycling of cotton is possible and it's on the market. And when you look here to the different steps of the recycling, you see there are uh, different steps where it is likely possible to remove pollutants. We have fiber separation. We have afterwards the, the dissolving and the wet spinning and also the carb carbamation uh, should be a step where uh, the pollution is possible, but at the moment there is no documentation on it. The last example is uh, the recycling of polyester and cotton. Here the example is a green machine. So this is a textile to textile recycling process, which was uh, developed by H&M and the Hong Kong Research Institute of Textile and Apparel. So the process is comparatively well developed and currently applied in a pre-industrialized plant, yeah, operating since 2018. I mean, you see from the plant, I mean, here you cannot at the moment uh, really uh, recycle tons. Um, it is, 
um, based on chemical and hydrothermal treatment under pressure. Um, and um, finally, uh, you separate here uh, the uh, polyester and the, the, the cotton. And the cotton is uh, processed to cellulose powder and is not used for new garments in a closed uh, loop, but you have uh, used for this, uh, there is a use for this uh, cotton, like a super absorber, for example, as materials. And the, the polyester uh, you recover as a, as a fiber. Um, the, uh, for, for this chemical uh, recycling, a biodegradable chemical is used. And therefore, the facility is called a green machine. I mean, using a green chemical, and also, I mean, because of the, the recycling, and is licensed, licensed here by uh, this HKRITA. Um, at the moment, three equipments are ordered uh, from a company in Turkey, from a company in Indonesia, and uh, from a GIZ project in Cambodia uh, to see. Um, if it, if, it, if it works uh, in, in, in practice. So there is, let's say one point, uh, which is at the moment critical. This is the energy consumption is very high due to the needed heat and pressure. And therefore the com commercial competitiveness need to be further assessed. But we will see that when we follow these kind of uh, three projects or at least the GIZ project in Cambodia uh, will probably publish results. So coming to conclusions and recommendations, while reuse and repurposing of textiles is useful, textile containing hazardous chemicals such as synthetic carpets or tents should only be reduced in low exposure scenarios, if at all. Carpets, tents, but also we have others like curtains or uniforms, which contain persistent organic pollutants like PFOS, P4, uh, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, hexabromocyclodecan, are actually not allowed to be recycled and 185 countries have ratified the Stockholm Convention. Yeah, so therefore also from regulatory perspective, there is a risk for some of the textiles. Um, and there is a, a limit from the Basel Convention on low pop content, uh, but I have not seen any study um, yet on this assessment. I know that the German government has a project now which is going to assess waste and uh, recycling in respect to PFAS. But so you see there, we are really at the very beginning. Also other legacy hazardous chemicals in textiles should be controlled and phased out. When we look to mechanical recycling of textile, it can likely not separate hazardous chemicals. Therefore the control of input textile containing hazardous chemicals by this kind of sorting um, is important to promote uh, mechanical recycling. Uh, mechanical recycling, in my opinion, should be guided by monitoring of pollutants in the recycling process, including exposure of workers, and also then the products mean exposure risk of, uh, of consumers. Um, several chemical recycling processes we have seen here have been developed in full scale for a nylon, uh, polyamide six, for PET, um, which is polyester, and also for cotton. These processes have inherent depollution steps, which likely remove at least a share of the hazardous additives. But here, really, research studies are needed to assess the removal efficiency, and uh, finally, also the waste, uh, which will need to be treated. Overall, the assessment of hazardous chemicals in textile recycling is at its infancy and it needs to be accelerated. In my opinion, here the industry have a big responsibility, but on the other hand, it's also an opportunity for the re research community. And I think that we will see a range of studies in the near future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Roland. That was uh, really a super interesting um, presentation there. I have a couple of questions for you, but before that, I would like to encourage our audience today to really get thinking and don't be shy. Please put your questions out there. If you have any questions, this is a brilliant opportunity to talk to our different speakers today and really generate a bit of a debate on, on you know, what your experiences are and, and what you think. 
So Roland, you've uh, talked, you've mentioned earlier about the how the recycled fiber had a lower carbon footprint. I imagine this is in comparison to the newer fibers. But my question was, if you compare mechanical versus chemical recycling, what is the environmental impact of each in terms of like water consumption and energy consumption is chemical? Because like chemical recycling, you said looks more like a silver bullet in terms of yeah. obtaining monomers and like being more of an ex comprehensive uh, process. But what is the environmental impact of one and the other? Yeah, uh, but also, I mean, there you have seen, I have shown you the three different processes, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and there you have seen, I mean, that industry is, is taking care, for example, that they are uh, using a green solvent, for example, yeah, and that they then uh, uh, put the, this uh, solvent then in, in, in a loop. Uh, but also, as you have seen, for example, for that process, um, uh, uh, you see that it is really uh, at, 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 at small scale, yeah? yeah? And afterwards, when you go to full scale, of course, it, it, you will see I mean, how is this recovering of the of of the solvent? Yeah, and and what is then there the ecological footprint? Um, so for, you think it's not comparable? The, huh? Maybe no. I you mean, think... for, I mean, I think for the for the mechanical recycling first, uh, the, the the footprint should even be uh, lower in respect to to, to energy. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but you see, uh, <laughs> at the moment there is. Uh, no real separation of these chemicals yeah and we will when we will come to that and maybe then see that uh, you will need this kind of pre-processing also uh, this might become then another calculation yeah so i think that also here in the in the assessment uh, we are uh, at, at a very early stage because we have not really looked into the details of that problem and here we can maybe look back to the to the e-waste plastic and in the e-waste plastic, uh, we, I, we know that 30 years ago, e-waste plastic was just recycled back to e-waste plastic. Yeah, So that was easy. But then uh, 10, 20 years, when we then got the, the, the ROS uh, regulation, then the industry could not just bring it back to the, uh, to, to the electronics, but that then they needed to have this kind of separation process. Yeah, And the separation process then, of course, at uh, carbon footprint um, at also environmental footprint. But when you look to the company, which is doing this kind of recycling of the e-waste plastic, so also they have a much lower footprint compared uh, to the virgin process. And also they have a, a, a lower footprint uh, compared to resources. Yeah. Okay. So that leads me on to my second question. Please be brief because we're already a bit <laughs> over time. But um, yeah, I, I find it really interesting, especially this um, aquafil process that you were describing. My question, which you also addressed in like conclusions a bit, is what do you think it takes to scale it up really uh, in, in an efficient way? Because you think the industry should be investing more? Is there from a governmental perspective? What does it really take to scale it up? No, no, rapidly? The, the aqua, uh, Kim, the aquafil is already uh, major. So that's already a full industrial process, fully But developed. scaling it up, I mean, worldwide with other companies doing the same and replicating no, this, like... No, no, I mean, this, I think uh, this can be done, I mean, for the aquafil, yeah? But I mean, we are here, let's say the big bullet is the last one. Yeah, I mean, that you have cotton and the polyester. And there you have seen, I mean, they are dealing with uh, hundreds of kilograms or so. And I think uh, first uh, to, to really scale this up to an industrial process, um, will be a, a real issue. And I said, I mean, with the energy, yeah, we will see. Um, for the other, I rather would say, uh, we will see how good the material you finally can get. Yeah, where, where I said you need at least 80% of, of these fibers. And there, I do not know the market. Yeah, and uh, there should be enough uh, resources to scale up these processes also in different regions. Okay. We do have a question from uh, the audience. Brenda Lopez is asking, I want to ask if the recycled fibers can be recycled again. <laughs> um, a, a good question. I mean, first, when you come to the, to the monomer recycling, I mean, monomer recycling is no problem because for if you go really back to the monomers, then you do the polymerization. So they are the same like before. 
So basically, they are, it, you can repeat. Um, interesting is to look to the cotton, for example, this means where you, where you keep the fiber. And there are a publication from uh, Palmer from 2019, and he says that cotton also during use is degraded a little bit yeah, during lifetime. And also then in the process of recycling, there is a small degradation. Uh, the Finnish company says we do not have a degradation. Uh, the research said there is a little bit degradation or at least some degradation. So we will see in future when you have some cycles where we, where, where we come to it. I mean, we know from paper recycling that paper recycling also cannot perpetuate it continuously because after some recycling, the fibers are too, too, too short. Yeah. So I think uh, this will be seen then when you have some recycling cycles. Yeah. But there are already some studies out. Okay, thank you, Roland. It looks like we have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, we're running a bit behind time, but I'm just going to take these two, if you can answer quickly. Um, Amal Patil is asking, if we cannot recycling, if we cannot recycle high pops PFAS containing textiles, does that mean we have hit a dead end for their recycling? Yeah, I mean, for the, for, for the high pop uh, textiles, my recommendation would be uh, to face them, to face them out and manage them. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but uh, it is only, let's say, a rather a, a rather small share of uh, the, the total materials. Yeah. So I think uh, here we need to be really clever. And there, I, I, I said there are really hardly any studies which have screened the tents. For example, I don't know how much percent of the tents uh, really have brominated flame retardants how much uh, PFAS I think many, many, many will have. And I think that also here, uh, a big research is needed to understand um, what materials we need to phase out. I mean, I already listed some, uh, but also if in this materials, maybe when we go to firefighting a garment, uh, if we see, okay, only 10% uh, of them have pops, yeah, 90% of firefighting garment might not have pops. Yeah, then also you can do, go there. But here, really much work is needed. Screening work, monitoring work. Okay, brilliant. And now we have Eloise. Thank you, Eloise, for your question. Um, for mixed fiber recycling, seems like there needs to be a minimum percentage for it to work. Many items have 20, 30% of lots of fibers. Will they ever be recyclable? Or should there be future policy to stop such highly mixed fiber? I would say there we have to ask the, the, the textile experts. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm not a textile expert, I'm okay. a chemical expert, but we have here Harald, uh, we have here uh, uh, Mr. Nimka. Yeah. So maybe if somebody wants to take over. Okay, brilliant. I'll leave this question then for Ulas. I'll take this opportunity to introduce him and we'll move on to the final presentation, which is Hidden Chemicals in Recycled Textiles, a black box. Thank you so much, Ulas, for joining us today. Um, if you want to put up your presentation, thank you. So Ulas uh, Nimka is the chairman of Nim Nimka Tech Technical Services, which is a textile and chemical testing laboratory. Nimka Tech Laboratory is dedicated to providing services in controlling has hazardous chemicals in the supply chain. And Mr. Nimka is a chartered colorist and fellow of the Society of Dyers and Colorists in the UK and the former founder of Textan, Texan Lab Laboratories, India's premier textile testing laboratory, providing advanced performance testing and analysis of restricted substances in apparel, textiles, dyes and chemicals. Thank you so much, uh, Ulas. Over to you. You are muted, Olas. Sorry. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> In the early years, no one said you are muted, but this is the new real norm now. So, um, since this is the fourth presentation, I think there will be some topics which will be an overlap, but I'll try and put them together. So, today, the story that I have chosen is to talk about hidden chemicals in recycled textiles and how I feel it is a black box. Okay, so to get a good time perspective, I'm going to start with our Earth, which is supposed to be 4.5 billion years old. And in all this time period, we as humans have been around only for 1.8 million years. 
And in all this time, we sourced things from nature and we lived without any problems. And we had a beautiful life. It all went on for these 1.8 million years. About 200 years ago, we discovered oil and petrochemicals. And this was a new toy for all the chemists. And we made some of the most wonderful products in the last 200 years, which changed our lives completely. And even in these 200 years, it's really the last 100 years, which has been the phenomenal growth of chemistry. And as you see the things on the right-hand side, right from new novel packaging materials to different automobile parts to make it more efficient to single-use plastics, to apparel, to food products, including electronics and so on, we have had a number of products. If you look at chemical production, in 1930, it was a mere 1 million tons. In the year 2020, we had already touched 1,000 million tons. So the important thing here to understand is that we had only 70 years to understand this. And in the last, in the next 10 years, it is predicted to double to 2,000 million tons. Now, our experience of handling these chemicals, as you can see, is less than a century. And we have, we have understood how to make them but we have not understood how to handle them. With all this, there has been a huge impact because of the industrialization. Harmful chemicals have been found in consumer products as we have seen in earlier discussions. There has been air pollution, water has been contaminated. There is hazardous waste that we see all around and we have no idea how we're gonna deal with it. In 2006 and seven, when the REACH legislation came and it combined several earlier laws together. It was the first systematic study in which all the 150,000 odd chemicals produced by man were classified and the hazardous ones were classified as carcinogenic, mutagenic, toxic to reproduction. You had additional categories which are now, we are really beginning to understand even more, are endocrine disruptors. You have skin sensitizers where a lot of work is going on as we speak. And of course, generally toxic chemicals to human health. Similarly, there, have, there has been an impact of chemicals on the environment. And of course, uh, we have here uh, heard about the persistent organic pollutants. And we have chemicals which are bioaccumulative, toxic, and there are also chemicals that lead to eutrophication of uh, natural water bodies. Since the 1990s, there has already been a good understanding in the textile industry. And the chemicals that I've listed here are the ones that have been regulated since the 90s. We have alkyl phenol ethylene oxide condensates, we have organotin compounds, we have banned amines, which are the starting material for certain azo dyes. We have polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, chlorinated phenols, PFCs that we've already discussed a lot about. We have carcinogenic and allergenic dyes. We have heavy metals, which we extracted from nature, but that it didn't exist in that form over there. Phthalates, formaldehyde, chromium-6, flame retardants, and this is only a very brief list. This is a very comprehensive list. And today, more than 900 chemicals are restricted in the textile, leather, and footwear supply chain. If we see the clothing that was used prior to the synthetics coming in, it was all from plant, animal, and mineral, mineral origin. But with the crude oil and with the petrochemicals, we come, came up with synthetics where you can see a number of fibers. Generally in the 1930s, this was acrylic, nylon, polyester, and this list is very long, it continues. We have elastomeric yarns, which is polyurethane and more acrylic and so on. Now, as we have seen in an earlier presentation, this has grown exponentially. The production was a mere 5,000 uh, million tons in 1940. That was just after the uh, invention or uh, with these inventions. And today it is 76,500,000 metric tons. And that's, this is growing exponentially even now as the share of cotton and other natural fibers is going down and the share of synthetics continues to go up. Polyester was the new kid on the block. Synthetic, purely synthetic material extremely cheap to produce and a wide variety of products could be made from this, including fibers for clothing and relatively not toxic and safe product. Polyester is used in the in textile and apparel industry and it's about 52% of the total fibers that are used. And 
it says about 32 million tons of the 57 million tons of polyester used is in the clothing industry. About 14% today is recycled, mostly from pet bottles, and the rest of it is still being explored. We saw this in the slide earlier, that starting from basic chemistry onto manufacture of synthetic fibers, it goes through a process where you have manufacture of yarn, fabric, this is processed in the chemical uh, wet processing industry. Then it goes to fabrication that's making up of a final article and eventually you have the article. I haven't extended it, but beyond that is the use from the consumers and the uh, problems during the use as well. And finally the disposal. And there are more than 5,000 chemicals that are used at all these stages put together. A little glimpse of what kind of chemicals are we talking about? So for coloration, once we had polyester, the dyes that were available for cotton and for wool and for silk earlier did not work. And you needed a total new class of dyes called dispersed dyes. Dispersed dyes are dyes which are insoluble in water. They're almost like pigments, which are by definition insoluble colorants. And these enter into the polyester and sit there mechanically. Nylon is dyed also with dispersed dyes, but mainly with acid dyes and metal complex dyes. You have acrylic where you use basic dyes. Basically, all these are very complex chemistries. And the reason for understanding this is that this is what we are adding to the polyester. Then for functional finishing. So when polyester first came into the market in the very early years, probably it did not have so many new finishing agents but subsequently consumer demands were continuously increasing. They wanted shirts which needed no ironing. So you had new finishes that came which did, did not need any ironing. So these were all uh, resins. Then you needed special softness property. So a whole range of new softeners came in. And then with different applicants applications, you wanted a water repellent finish, an oil repellent finish, a flame retardant finish, anti-static property, and the list goes on and on and on. And the perfluorinated chemistry that we've been talking about typically combines both oil and water repellency. We can get water repellency with many other techniques, but certainly we cannot get adequate oil repellency. Now the question comes up that is oil repellency that relevant for clothing, for apparel and so on is a big debate or we were just using it because it was available. Of course, there are certain applications where we need it, but they are far and few between. If we look at some of the hazardous chemicals that are, that are used somewhere in the polyester processing, we already had uh, antimony covered in the presentation earlier. We've already had PFCs covered earlier. We also had APEOs covered earlier. APEOs incidentally are alkyl phenol ethoxylates. And this is a molecule which has different chain lengths, right starting from three and four moles of ethoxylates right up to almost 100 moles of ethoxylates. And each of these ch different chain lengths have got different properties and different uses. So they are right from lubricants to dispersing agents, wetting agents, surfactants, um, washing fast washing agents, and so on. They have a wide range, of, and they're the most economical, most cheap, and most effective. We do have some substitutes today, but still the alkyl phenol ethoxylates seem to be the most, uh, most uh, effective ones. We have now alcohol ethoxylates, which are the substitute, which are safer. Because what happens with APOs, it degrades into a molecule which mimics the female hormone estrogen, and that's the challenge. So it acts as an endocrine disrupting chemical. You have allergenic dispersed dyes. When dispersed dyes, when nylon came onto the market and then polyester, the first thing that became very popular was uh, ladies' stockings. And very soon in the 19, thir late 30s and early 40s, there were women in England and women in other Western countries where they developed allergy on their legs. And at that time, nobody realized what it was due to, and it was called as stocking allergy. But these were in effect due to the dyes that were used for coloring these stockings. If you look at the current fashion model, right from farming through the entire process of manufacture of the article use, finally, we just end up throwing it and it goes into waste, mostly into landfill. The report that was done by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation really gave some very shocking statistics that 73% goes into landfill or is actually incinerated. Less than 1% goes into closed loop recycling. This is certainly not going to be 
a viable option or a sustainable option from a long-term point of view. So why do we need to encourage circular fashion? Because 60%, more than 60% of garments are today made of polyester. And this is just increasing because now you have new polyester, which almost has the feel of cotton. So the reasons why people use cotton and silk, you can give different finishes to polyester to mimic and to almost reproduce the effect. According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we use 342 million barrels of oil to produce these uh, plastic-based clothing. So if we do not reuse, recycle our clothes, we will lead ourselves to a resourceless future. And that is not sustainable. We have to treat our waste now as a resource in the coming years, in the coming decades, in the coming centuries and the next millennium. The waste has to become a resource and closing the loop is going to be most important. Using recycled polyester is one such mechanism to move towards a more circular economy. So from a straight line, we have to move into this circular pattern where we start with raw materials, ideally design a product. A product design is going to be going to play an extremely important role in the, in the next in the future because we will have to design a product keeping in mind that it has to be recycled at the end of life. And of course, in between we have where we have a closed loop where we can use the clothes longer. Fast fashion is has to go out. It cannot be a long-term solution. We have to see how we can rent clothes, reuse clothes, repair, maybe redesign and resell them. But eventually, ideally, if we come to a situation wherein we have a fiber to fiber, 100% recycling, that is going to be the final goal. To that extent, one of the leading textile organizations called the Textile Exchange has recently come up with a recycled polyester challenge for the industry. And this is uh, jointly in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So the Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Change, Climate Action, they have launched this program. And I quote from their, uh, what they say, we are challenging the apparel industry to commit to bringing the percentage of recycled polyester up from 14% to 45% at 17 million metric tons by the year 2025. So this is the new challenge to the fashion industry. And there has been a phenomenal response. And as you can see from here, a large number of leading brands have volunteered to accept this challenge. And there, each one is trying to come up with ideas on how they can implement this. We have already seen a little bit of it, but in practical terms, what is it that is available on the market? What is recycled polyester? So we have two types that are currently sold on the market. So we have one where PET bottles, which are used for drinking water, are recycled. So there has been, this is post-consumer collection and recycling. And this has been around for, I think, perhaps 20 years now. We have a very, very large factory here, about 200 kilometers from where I am in Mumbai. And this has been supplying recycled polyester yarn, which is almost as good as virgin yarn, no problem whatsoever. The other one that we see on the market is from converting uh, polyester from waste that is collected from ocean plastic. Here, I want to bring forward a case study. This is something that we studied here at Nimcatech. And uh, this is something that I'd like to share because this is a concern that I have. Here we had polyester yarn, which was made from uh, recycled ocean waste into a yarn. It was, when I put two yarns next to each other, the virgin yarn and the recycled yarn, from physical appearance or from the characteristics of the yarn, the strength properties, it's any other chemical properties, we couldn't tell the difference whatsoever. But in one particular factory where this yarn was being used, about 25 out of 200 workers who were in the knitting plant developed a severe skin allergy within a few days of working and handling this particular recycled polyester yarn. And you can see on uh, the photograph on the, on the left, and uh, this is the kind of patches that were produced on the workers. And um, it was, they had to stop using this yarn. And subsequently, uh, this was sent to our laboratory for analysis. We did uh, a lot of studies on the virgin yarn and the recycled yarn. And um, for those who are technical people and technologists from over here, I would like to explain that we did a solvent extraction of both these yarns. And then we did a gas chromatography cup on with mass spectrometry. 
And on the extract that we got from the virgin yarn, we did not find even a single impurity present in the extract. But the extract from the recycled ocean waste plastic yarn, ocean waste polyester yarn, we had 50 plus impurities that were seen on the gas chromatograph. So in between, we had 50 peaks, out of which three were major peaks. The remaining 48, we couldn't identify all, but we really focused on those three. And um, finally, we, got, we, we were able to identify these compounds. We then got in touch with the medical people and the dermatologists in that country. They developed a patch test for those three chemicals. And the very interesting observation was that the minute they touched this patch test to the workers, or not the minute, but in, the, in about a few hours after uh, the patch test was applied, the workers redeveloped the allergy in the areas where they were sensitized earlier. There was nothing below the patch, actually. This was a strange observation. There was nothing below the patch, but wherever they were sensitized earlier, all those areas became inflamed, just like what you are seeing in the photograph above. Now, in this case, this particular yarn was meant to be used for men's undergarments. And the observation was, however, that once the yarn was processed, None of these residual chemicals were there on the finished garment, on the finished product. So subsequently, after they were dyed, which were of course with dispersed dyes because it's polyester, there was not even a trace of the impurities seen on the end article, which was fortunate in this particular case, but this is a one single study that I can present because we did it ourselves. But uh, so in this case, it was a big problem for the workers handling this yarn. Perhaps it may not have been a problem for the final consumers. We don't really know what was done after the study, whether the goods were sold, whether they were not sold. But I can definitely confirm that all these impurities finally went into the wastewater where, these, where the fabric was processed. Whether the effluent treatment that is there in a typical textile plant was adequate to address these chemicals, I do not know because as I said, out of 52 impurities, we only identified three. We have no idea what the remaining 48 were. This is a study, and I think these kind of problems will become more evident as we go along with our recycling initiatives. I've just put some points over here, which I think are uh, important from my point of view. I've said recycled fibers and yarn from pet bottles, as I mentioned earlier, is effective and commercially adopted for a number of years now. Yarn from ocean plastic did cause a problem in this particular batch. Whether it will cause a problem in every batch is not known. Chemical residues carried forward into recycled material is completely unknown. Another challenge would be breakdown of molecules into unknown metabolites during processing will remain a challenge. We had in, uh, in a presentation earlier, we saw that the, the dye molecules are very large molecules. Some can be small for polyester, but they can be large molecules for cellulosics and for other materials. And we have no clue how they will break down under different conditions, because we may, we may process them, we may break them down differently. They may decolorize surely, but how they will break down is not known. As we move towards post-consumer recycling of synthetic clothing, this challenge will grow significantly as potentially hundreds, perhaps even thousands of chemicals can be carried forward. So if this is a challenge from pet bottles, which almost contains no chemicals, and when we move to post-consumer recycling, I don't know, it is a nightmare. Mixed material means each batch of recycled material could potentially be a cocktail of different chemical residues because you will never be able to recycle uh, post-consumer clothing if it's collected from consumers ever. If it's collected as factory waste, perhaps yes, because it may be of the same type. It is not known how this will impact both human health and the environment. Recycling of synthetic clothing, so in my opinion, remains a challenge. And this is indeed a black box, what I call of hazardous chemicals. A little bit about our organization, very briefly about Nimka Tech. We are a partner to the textile, apparel, leather, and chemical industry, and we have been specializing in this area. And I'm very proud to say that we are four generations in this line now, right from 1922. And um, we are, I, I'm the third generation, and my daughter now runs this company. She's the fourth generation. 
And as I have presented it earlier, that two and a half generations, that's half my time, we have been part of the creation of today's problem. And one and a half generations, I'm now we are trying to see how we can help in cleaning up. So this is a initiative that we have. One of the things that we do is we have a platform called Notes for training. And uh, from Notes, we provide training, especially in chemical management. And this is provide, so we didn't develop this during the pandemic or after the pandemic, we started this in 2014. So perhaps we had the vision of this right about almost six years, eight years ago. Till now we have provided training to over 10,000 factories in over 50 countries. We have developed modules in Spanish, Italian and Chinese so far, but it can be localized in almost any language of the world. We also develop customized bespoke training, which is this is possible depending on whatever you want to educate your supply chain. And our tool also offers the learner tracking and grading abilities. Our laboratory, we specialize in testing of chemicals uh, along with end articles, but specialize in chemicals. And we, have, we are approved for level one and level two certification of uh, the ZDHC MRSL, which, is, which was referred to in earlier presentations. We also test chemicals which conform to GOTS version six. Very soon we'll have version seven. It's under discussion now. We have ecotoxicity testing, which we do where we do actually uh, tests on chemicals for uh, biodegradability. Here we do uh, ready biodegradability, inherent biodegradability, and we also do some toxicity studying studies using algal toxicity. Uh, in our conventional testing, we also do tests on textile and apparel. We do performance testing. We also analyze water. And for the EU REACH regu uh, regulation, we do what is called as sameness studies, that is a molecular characterization. Very soon in the next coming, maybe three or four months, we will have the Indian CMSR guidelines, which it will be enacted into a legislation, perhaps on the lines of reach. This is something where India is, has been delayed already, our inventory, and we will have similar requirements um, as the requirements for reach. In our chemical strategy and consultancy, we help small brands initiate a program because not many of them would have chemistry as their strength. And, uh, but however, they need to sell clothes and products and articles which are having chemicals. Then we do data management and reporting. This is something that we do at the back end for helping the brands who are into very high tech uh, um, research areas and high tech studies in their supply chain we try and map this data and we help them interpret this data in terms of, uh, um, so that uh, it's presented back to them with some meaningful reports. We do root cause analysis, you know, in spite of all the precautions that companies may do in chemicals, in usage, in products, there will be something that has still gone wrong. And then we would deep dive into that and do a root cause analysis to try and identify if we could understand what has gone wrong and maybe perhaps we can have a corrective action that is done. With this, I come to an end of my presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And it was indeed a pleasure to be a part of this webinar. Thank you. So much, Ulas. That was an absolute great presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, someone from the audience, Jessica, OX shot was asking if you could share the three impurities that you identified in that very interesting case study. I don't know if you know them off the top of your head. Yeah, they're primarily different type of glycols. Okay, maybe we can also add that and send it in the uh, links with the presentations that we will send to everybody later. And coming back to the previous question that we had from Eloise, um, she was asking uh, for mixed fiber recycling. It seems like there is a there needs to there needs to be a minimum percentage for it to work. Many items have 20, 30 percent of uh, many different fibers. Will there ever be recyclable, or should there be future policy to stop such high, highly mixed fiber? Do you think you could give us your insights on that? In my opinion, recycling mixed fibers is going to be a challenge and there will not be a very practical solution in the near future. I feel what will happen is perhaps there will be new innovation and people will come with completely new ideas and they will design products which are meant for recycling. 
as I can recall one, uh, one um, conference many years ago where I was uh, present and we had a very senior German professor and there was a discussion that today a, a, a sports shoe probably comprises of over 80 components. So how would you recycle it in the future? And then his answer from the stage at that time was that perhaps we will look at all products being made from a single chemistry so that there is a technique by which we can recycle and bring it back into monomers as was explained earlier, and that will help. So uh, these are all novel ideas. These are ideas that will come up now once there is a need, and this has been identified as a problem. I'm sure there would be researchers who would think and designers who would also be need to train like this because it's not going to be possible to separate fibers and chemically to separate each of these different materials and the hundreds of chemicals that are going to come onto it, it's not going to be an easy job. Of course, I coincide. I think we, from SCP Rack as well, we do huge efforts in, in the prevention. So I think avoiding very early in the design stage is, is probably the way to go forward in the future. We have one last question that I'm going to take from the audience, which is from Amol. Uh, she says, thank you for the insightful presentation. Regarding the ocean plastic example, does this issue could potentially turn away consumers from accepting recycled PET apparels in the coming future? I feel this is, you know, many brands have gone and put up on their websites and publicly said that they would re use recycled materials 10, 20, 30, 50, and 100% by a certain time period without really understanding how we are going to recycle these materials. It is indeed going to be a challenge and we will have to find, you know, really good ways of how this is going to work. It's one thing to come up and make a statement and, you know, you have got uh, various collection initiatives that have been around the world for many years now, but uh, what happens to those clothes at the, after they have been collected? And, um, you know, in my opinion, reuse of a clothing for some other applications is not circular. It's only convenience. Uh, like I remember visiting a factory in Germany many years ago, I think it was 1997, wherein they were shredding denim jeans and compressing them as a reinforced material in melamine formaldehyde resins. And we were told at that time, this was used to make the inner panels of the Mercedes Benz car. Now, in a way you could say that this is reuse of fiber, but is it circular? Well, I don't think so. So yeah. we will have to have our definitions clear and our goals clear. And if we look at the next 100 years, see, don't forget what I told you, all these problems are only of last 50 years. So if this is the magnitude of the problem of the last 50, no, only 50 years, we'll have to think of what is sustainable over the next 500 years, not, 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 not next 10, 20 years. So these are ideas for sustainable chemistry. Indeed. Thank you so much, Rilas. That will be all for today. I would like to round up and finish up with a, uh, po another poll. I'm going to launch it now. If you can take just a couple of minutes to answer, that would be really nice. Um, we mainly just want to remind you also that if you have any feedback, uh, any comments, any other questions that haven't been answered today, you can address them to myself, Kimberly de Miguel. I've posted the uh, email address and Going back to the poll, have you learned something new today? Yes, thank you. That's 100% answers. I'm really happy to hear that. The second question that we were curious to hear was which session was most useful, most relevant to you? We have many um, answers on the first, the second, third, and particularly the, the fourth. So thank you so much, Ulas, for your contribution. It seems it's been really, really relevant to everyone. Um, and would you like to receive any further news about our work? Again, just a brief reminder to please follow us on our social media networks. Uh, we will have another um, series of these webinars coming up next Friday, 13th, same time. Um, please register. It will be on bioplastics, a really hot topic. I'm sure many of you will be interested. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you all back next Friday. Magali, I see you are connected. Any words? <laughs> You're muted. No, no, well, just, uh, it was just to say goodbye. Uh, thank you very much for the, the very insightful presentations uh, today. I think it was very, very interesting. Uh, we are um, 
we've seen that we are still at the, the beginning of closing the loop uh, for uh, uh, textiles. So we will uh, be in touch for further work. Yeah. The end. Okay, well, thank you so much. And a special thank you to our panelists today. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Teresa. And thank you, Ulas. I hope you have a really good rest of your day today. Okay, goodbye. Welcome. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>